Amen. Take your Bibles, open them to Daniel chapter 3 as we finish the chapter today in a Bible study that I've entitled, When the Fiery Trials Are Heated Up. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation as we're studying through the book of Daniel. And we left off with these three young men who stood their ground before the most powerful leader of the known world. They were confident. But their confidence wasn't in themselves. Their confidence was in God. And it wasn't new because they gained confidence very early in their youth. And it continued on through their teenage years and all the temptations that came. And now they didn't, they came ready for the big test. And might I just add, you never know what the big test is or when it's coming. And the way that you prepare for the big test is by being faithful in the little things. As you gain strength in being faithful in the little things, it doesn't matter what test comes your way, big or small, known or unexpected, you'll be ready. And we learned before the king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood with, answered in, assurance. The type of trust that all of us as believers of all time share. But even greater for you and me in the new covenant, our trust has been deposited in us by the Holy Spirit. We have today what those young men didn't have back then. They had a faith looking forward to Messiah, where the Holy Spirit would come upon them, but we live now looking back on the finished work of Jesus where the Holy Spirit dwells permanently inside of us. And men and women who love God, the natural byproduct of a love relationship with God is more and more trust over time. I'm reminded of what Job said in Job 13 verse 15. He said, God might kill me, but I have no other hope. I am going to argue my case with him. You might remember it in the New King James. He says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. I will trust God no matter what happens to me. And so notice with me, pick up with me in verse 19 where we left off in chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. Verse 22. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. Again, we're introduced or reminded of Nebuchadnezzar and his rage and his out of control anger. 20 years can change a man, change your mind, and he's not used to anyone standing up to him. He's not used to anyone saying no, refusing his commands. And you could see it on his face. The Bible says that his face was distorted with rage. And you know the reality of ministry has a lot to do with you paying attention to someone's countenance. That's the old King James view or word. Someone's face. You can tell a lot about a person by just watching them and paying attention to their face, to their eyes. And obviously it would be very easy for, to see someone that's distorted with rage but you can also see more someone that's hurting, someone that's happy, someone that is perplexed, and it opens a door to enter in to people's lives. Not everyone's just gonna invite you into their life. Not everyone's just gonna say, yeah, this is my whole life, I'm gonna tell you, would you? Not everyone does that, but you and I, we can learn how to insert ourselves into people's lives with watching their mannerisms, asking key questions. With Nebuchadnezzar, it wouldn't be hard to see this guy's ticked off. And what does he order? He orders that the furnace becomes seven times hotter. And they're taken and they're thrown into this fiery furnace, to this pit. And I think at this point, as we're watching the scene, we're seeing these young men in their 20s being, losing their life for the simple choice not to bow down to an idol. And in our own humanity, as we watch this, just kind of seeing it with our own eyes, coming to our own conclusion, we might conclude, how tragic. Here are these young men that love God, 
that are committed to him, that, that have such a great future ahead of them, and they're just, what are they doing? But trusting God, no compromise, and they're thrown in the fire anyway? It would be easy, especially those of you that are more black and white in how you see the world, to just cry, not fair. That's not fair. It's not right. What's going on here? And yet, in their lives, what else is there at this point? What else is there for them? They've been given the test, they refuse to bow down, and they're ready to take the consequence. They're ready to take what is given to them. They have committed their lives to a faithful God. Remember, they were threatened. Hey, you know what? If you don't bow down, then you're going to die. They go, hey, you know, I know that God can deliver me. But even if he doesn't deliver me, I'm committed to him. And so what else is there? Jot it down in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Peter writes, dear friends, don't be surprised, or in the, old, in the New King James, don't think it's strange. Don't be surprised by the fiery trials you're going through as if some strange thing were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you'll have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. Listen, you don't fit into this world. This world is not your home. And some of you are frustrated right now because you've done what is right, you've taken a stand for righteousness, and you got fired. And you're like, that's not fair. Well, what did you expect? You took a stand for what was right. You committed your life to a faithful God. And whether you work or don't work at that particular place, your relationship is with God. It's not with your job. It's not with your paycheck. God will provide a paycheck for you. He'll provide for all of your need according to your riches in Christ Jesus. Like, he'll give you what is needed before, during, and after your commitment to him. I mean, after all, what is it that you signed up for? An easy life? What is it that you committed to when you said, I'm ready to take the exchange, God's perfect life in Jesus Christ for my imperfect life? the forgiveness of my sin, the removal of my guilt and shame in, re- in exchange for what? My commitment to follow him. And God is speaking to someone today reminding you, what, what did you expect? There are times where we want our cake and eat it too. We, we want to follow Christ and we want to avoid the fiery trials. But remember, the Bible teaches us that even the desire to live a godly life will bring persecution. Just the desire just the commitment. You're praying and God's opening up the word to you and he, he has this scripture that says, this is what you're gonna be doing. Huh? This is where I'm taking you. This is what I, you know, you, you think of uh, Kyle and Krista in Brazil where, where they answer the call, a deep call. It didn't come immediately. Their first call was to buy a boat and be on this boat. They sold everything they own to buy a boat and they went from port to port ministering the gospel and they found out that that was not God's call for their life. They were not to be on a boat, but they spent a year on a boat to figure that out. It's like, no, this wasn't from the Lord. So what did they do? They sold the boat and they felt a burden during those trips to go to Brazil. And they find themselves, and I'm, I'm very much paraphrasing, the, if they were here, they would give you a much more, uh, much more insight on their calling. But they sold the boat and then they settled down in Brazil and it's been hard and it's been super difficult. Met with resistance after resistance after resistance. And when I've had the chance to talk to them and I've had the chance to encourage them, I certainly didn't say, well, what did you expect, man? But I did walk them along the path that would very gently ask them, well, what did you expect? You're on the front lines of the battle. You are at the very edge. You are out in front. And a leader takes the hits first. That's what the person up front, the point man, he takes the hit first. And I know that as they learned with the boat that they knew it wouldn't be easy, but they learned how how much it wouldn't be easy. And when they came to Brazil, they knew it wouldn't be easy, but they learned how much it wouldn't be easy. And time and time again in our life, in our calling, whatever God has called you to do, and you have taken a stand for the Lord, that doesn't mean that the world is going to love you. That doesn't mean that the fires of hell are going to be lowered for you. And so the devil says, oh, great, another believer taking a stand for God. No, rather the fires are going to get hotter and hotter and hotter and you'll be thrown in. It was 
a true story is told of an early church father. His name was Polycarp. He was actually the overseers of the churches in the area of Smyrna. Polycarp was a personal friend and student of John the Apostle. And in 156 AD, when he was 86 years old, he was urged by the Roman proconsul to finally, at the end of his life, reproach Christ and he would be set free. And his answer to the Roman proconsul was this, and I quote, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? End quote. Well, to that the Roman proconsul said, I have respect for your age. Simply say, away with the atheists and be set free. And so Polycarp solemnly said, away with the atheists, pointing to the pagan crowd that he was passing by. And there he went joyfully to the stake. Polycarp, 86 years old. You would think by 86 you'd get a pass on persecution. At some age, some of you are thinking, maybe if I could just make it to 80, no more trouble. Well, you need to stand in line for Polycarp when you get to heaven. And say, how was it at 86? Do you think you got a pass? No, there are no passes with Jesus Christ. There's only protection. There's, there's only encouragement. And even when we think of protection, we think, well, maybe he'll protect me from the fiery furnace. Not with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went in seven times hotter. And he went, Polycarp did, joyfully to the stake, thanking God for counting him worthy to be numbered among the martyrs. And that's where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego here, they're steadfast. Notice back in verse 20, it says, Then he ordered some of the strongest men, these men of valor, to bind these young men and throw them into the blazing furnace to take them to the pit. And when the, my, these mighty men of valor, these men got close, after they tied them up in their clothes, it says, because in verse 22, the fire was, because the king demanded it, the, uh, such a hot fire that the flames killed the soldiers. This was a great loss for Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sure this was God continuing to speak to him of judgment, of judgment. The king lost these men and they lost their lives. No doubt, I think, a heavy blow of judgment to the king. Here he is thinking he's the judge. Here he is thinking he's doing the judging, that he's in control, that he's ruling the world, that his word is firm, that he snaps his fingers and people do exactly what he's told, and yet God is on the throne. You see, when you serve God and live for him, when you're committed to him, the wicked... The wicked, there are still wicked in the world today. The wicked that might be coming against you. The wicked that might be persecuting you. The wicked that might be thinking they have the upper hand in your life. That they're on the side of the king. And they're on the side of the person that's in control. And they have all these people telling them it's great. It's wonderful. You are right. And they bind you up. And they take you to the fire. Listen, when, God, when you serve God and live for him, abiding in Christ, the wicked are going to be taken care of by God. The wicked will be taken care of by God. Many times the example is given in scriptures that God will take in, in, in great irony, he will take what the devil intended for evil for you, turning it around for good and flipping it right back on the wicked. Just like he does here. You need to remember this. Nobody at any time, mark this down, knock, write this down, put it on your hand, write it in the margin of your Bible. This is a verse of freedom. This is a verse of faith and confidence, or this is a statement, I should say, of freedom, a statement of confidence. Nobody at any time is ever going to get away with anything. And you go, Ed, but they're getting away with it right now. Yeah, they're even making the fires hotter, aren't they? Even making the fires hotter. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, is that you think in your mind, well, if they're not going to get away with it, then your thought is, well, get them, Lord. Well, these guys are going to be burned up, but not Nebuchadnezzar. You see, the greatest thing that can happen to your enemies is that they get saved. Not that they get burned. <laughs> so stop praying that way right now. Well, Lord, just get them. Well, you can, hold, you can ask that God hold them back, 
You can ask God to bring about the consequences of their decisions. You can ask God, you go, Ed, but Ed, it says to do good to them. Okay, then, then ask God to bring them to the end of themselves. Ask God to allow the truth of Galatians that if they sow to the flesh, that they're going to reap corruption, that, that it's going to pain them, that, that Nebuchadnezzar suffered personal pain as he lost these mighty men of valor. These were his right-hand guys. These were the people that were closest to him, people that he trusted. He lost them. But Nebuchadnezzar, well, we know if you read ahead, they don't know it yet, but we know the rest of the text that Nebuchadnezzar gets saved. And that's the greatest thing that can happen to the wicked in your life right now. But as I said before, nobody at any time is ever going to get away with anything. And that you just deposit that in your heart and go back to following the Lord. Get your eyes off your enemy. Get your eyes back on the Lord. Get your eyes off the people picking on you. Get your eyes back on the Lord. Get, the, get your eyes off the people talking about you, posting about you, doing about you, about you, about you, about you. It's not about you. Get your eyes on the Lord. And he'll take care of you. He'll watch over you. He can see your back. You can't even see your back. You don't even know what's coming behind you. You don't have no idea what's sneaking up on you. God knows. Keep your eyes firmly fixed on him. And so this steadfast confidence. By the way, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 19. Do not fret because of evildoers. And don't envy the wicked, the Bible says. Don't fret. Don't worry about it. Take it easy when it comes to the wicked. Relax. Verse 24. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up? Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did. They replied, look, verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god, little g. Or in the Aramaic, it was, it's, there's a side note that says, the son of a god. Wow. Isn't this great? The king is astonished at the judgment that he thinks he's bringing because God supersedes it. Didn't we throw three men? Yes, we threw three men, but I see four. Now, I think there's a supernatural thing going on here. How can you see in the fiery furnace that has been lit up seven times more that your men can't even get close to without dying? How is it possible that Nebuchadnezzar has any frame of reference of what's going down in the pit except that God revealed it to him? and showed him something special. God wanted him to see, not those three guys, God wanted him to see this pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. God wanted that to be deposited in his life. Because haven't you found it to be true that in the fires of life, the Lord shows up in a powerful way, like no other way before? Not only that, but they're still alive. They're still alive in the fire. They're not trying to climb the walls to get out. They're not screaming in anguish. They're not upset. They're not pointing a finger at their mighty God. They're, they're right there talking to a fourth person. There's something special about the fourth one, and the Bible wants us to understand this. The Bible wants us to un the understand the supernatural around what Nebuchadnezzar thinks is the final word. You see, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't get the final word. God always gets the final word. He always gets the final word. And Nebuchadnezzar's pagan background called him, you know, caused him, he only, his only frame of reference is that he's one of the son of God. You know, he looks like a son of God. He, that's his frame of reference. And might I just say, be patient with people you're sharing the gospel with that doesn't know, they don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know anything about church. And they're just using the language they know. You know, you don't have to correct them and give them a theological study on everything they don't know. Just meet them where they're at. And explain to them what they don't know. You know, give them the answer. Oh, you know, that, I, you, you might be there with Nebuchadnezzar. You know, you're there. And you're, oh, that's like the son of God. No, 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 no. Don't say that. Capital G, Nebuchadnezzar. Capital G. That's the son of God. You know, you know, just meet them where he's at. Because God has a plan for Nebuchadnezzar. And God has a plan for your coworker and your mom. But it doesn't include you being hypercritical and judgmental of them all the time. That they don't have the right language that they don't know the right words. They don't have the Christianese. They don't need the Christianese. God's going to meet them right where they're at and use where they came from. That's why one of the beautiful things about sharing the gospel is to get to know the other person. Get to know where they came from. That way you could take the word and just deliver it right to where they're at. Meet them where they're at. 
I've often used that illustration of building a bridge. You know, you're building a bridge from one place over the chasm of distance between you and that other person. Or, you know, you get the picture of a large body of water and a bridge goes over it to bridge the, the different banks on either side. And as you're building a bridge, the idea of building a bridge is to meet someone where they are and gently take them back with you. It's not to argue with them not to somehow try to convince them with your great arguments, and it's to express love to them so that through the channel of love, truth can be delivered. So Nebuchadnezzar, he's just sharing with his, his frame of reference, but it's obviously supernatural. And this is a pre-incarnate appearance, I believe, of Jesus Christ, an appearance of the eternal Son of God before he took a permanent residence one and only time did he take up personal per residence in a human body in the womb of Jesus. But he appeared in Genesis 18 to Abraham. He appeared to Joshua in Joshua chapter 5. He appeared to Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And here he is in the fiery furnace, which is very special to those of us that have gone through or even live in a fiery furnace. Imagine that. God has asked you to build a house in the fiery furnace to live there for a while. You're not trying to climb out. You're already done trying to climb out and you're just like, this is my life. This is where God has me right now. And even though the flames are around me and even though it's difficult, the Bible says, don't think it's strange. It's not a strange thing what you're going through. It only becomes strange when you begin to think that God owes you more than he's given to you in Jesus Christ. It only becomes strange when you compare yourself with someone else. Well, you know, they've got that and I don't have that. Well, that's God's will for your life. Yeah, but uh, you know, they, they seem to have it easy and I seem to have it hard. That's God's will for your life. Maybe you're in a place right now where you've made mistakes for the last 10 years, 20 years. And you go, well, you know, if I didn't, but that's God's will for your life. As long as you keep living in the past, you're gonna miss today. What is God doing today? Well, you know, I don't have that. And you're probably not gonna have that with that kind of attitude, but you have God and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, and you had to build your house in the fires. But isn't it in the fires? Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego didn't meet the pre-incarnate. Uh, they, they've been living in, in Babylon now for 20 years. They took a stand earlier with Daniel at the table. They didn't meet Jesus. They didn't meet this pre-incarnate appearance of God until they were in the fires. And while you're ignoring the presence of God in your life and complaining about your station in life and complaining about what you don't have and complaining about whatever, you're going to miss what God's doing and your life's going to pass you by and then your life's just going to be known as one big complaint instead of what God's doing in your life right now. What's he want to do in your life right now? This is his will. Oh, I'm in the fiery furnace. I know. So are a lot of people. It's like a little neighborhood there. <laughs> We've all built our house there. There's a condo place there. There's an apartment building there. We're all there, man. We're renting rooms there. The whole world is a fiery furnace. But we're not going to eternal flames apart from God the rest of our lives for all eternity because Jesus Christ forgave us. So he's there with us. That's the best thing about the flames. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. Now, Check this out. This is an amazing, amazing, amazing. I don't, don't miss this. Remember, it says in, in verse 23, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the flames, the roaring flames. They, they went in tied, and they went in bound. And in being tied up and bound... And in the midst of fiery furnace, the flames, they met the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ that was talking to them. And notice in verse 25, it says, Nebuchadnezzar shouts, I see four men unbound. They went in bound, but in the flames, they were unbound. They were loosed. That gives us insights about trials in our lives. Because they went in bound, but they end up loose. How did that happen? Well, God could have miraculously, this could be another miraculous appearance of God to just unloose them without them being burned up. I mean, this whole thing is the miraculous hand of God. Just like you have testimonies, the miraculous hand of God. People don't believe you. They don't believe what you're sharing because it's just totally the Lord. You just, and, and you kind of feel, I don't know if I want to share anymore because nobody believes me. Well, only people with spiritual eyes will believe you. 
Nebuchadnezzar's tripping out, but he sees what he sees. So don't worry about how people respond to you. You keep sharing your testimony. Keep sharing what God has done in your life. Don't worry about how people respond. Nebuchadnezzar's being set up, and so are the people around you. Now, they go in bound, but they come out loose, or they're there loose. Perhaps, and this is a thought for you to chew on this week, perhaps the fire that was intended by man to destroy them was used by God to destroy the bonds that were holding them captive, which gives us an illustration, and that's this. I wonder what we're so used to and bound up in that a trial reveals to us you need to be loosed from that. That the trial itself is the tool of God to loosen the bonds that you have of comfort and ease and bad attitudes and whatever else it is, that the fires of the trials that were meant to destroy you, remember Joseph, his testimony, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, you meant evil against me. What you did to me, throwing me in the pit and it put me on this path that was just destructive. What you meant for evil, God turned around for good. And he can do that with the fiery trials in your life. But as the Bible says, we need to learn not to, not to complain and murmur all the time. It doesn't help. Well, notice verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach. Now, how do you think he shouted? Because that's, you know, we don't get that. You know, Shadrach, me, Shadrach, I'm, in, I'm big Nebuchadnezzar. No, maybe, hey, Shadrach. You know, who knows what he said, how he said it. But he says, servant of the most, come out. There's an exclamation point, so he's probably yelling, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. And the high officers, officials, governors, advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire, mark this, had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Now some of you are going to totally get this. Many of you don't have anything, any idea when I'm really. But remember when they allowed smoking in restaurants like the Village Inn? And you would go to breakfast with your family at the Village Inn, even if you went into that little cage. I don't remember which one they let smoking, but there was that cage where they didn't let smoking, but like the cage didn't hold the smoke out. Like there were times when you couldn't go into Village Inn and not come out smelling like smoke. You guys with me? So here are these guys, seven, five, seven times hotter fire. Nothing about them got singed, and they don't even smell like smoke. Now, I remember the smell of smoke after a fire is nasty. Because not too many years ago, that was our house. Our house. Our kitchen caught on fire while we were away, and our whole house was filled with smoke. We were just minutes away from that house going up like toothpicks. And it didn't, fortunately. But the entire inside of our house was a complete total loss. Everything, clothes, possessions, furniture, everything was a complete loss. And they came in, the, the people that do, you know, fix things and clean things after a disaster, the recovery people. They came in, did a phenomenal job, tore everything down. They sprayed this stuff on that's supposed to take away the smell and put new dry. They rebuilt the inside of our house. And I'm telling you, you would never even know that there was a fire in our house until you walked down the basement stairs, which they didn't touch because pretty much everything stayed out of the basement, except if you walk down in the wrong kind of angle down the basement stairs, which isn't finished, and the handle there is still there, the drywall is still there. If you walk down and you just, in the breathing at the right time, you go, oh man, I remember my whole house and garage and everything I own smell like that. But when God is there in your life, you'll be thrown into the fires and they will not touch you they will not mess with you, and you won't even smell like the trial that you've been in. I mean, that's the power of God. That's where these guys are. The only thing that was burned up in the trial were the things that bound them. And Nebuchadnezzar is learning right now this invitation to come out. He says, now notice in, in verse 27, all the high officials were all there. They noticed all that. Verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise 
to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree, if any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb. That's the way to treat them, Nebuchadnezzar. And their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Here's what we call what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We call that divine protection. I like that, divine protection. We know that God will protect us until his purposes for us in life are fulfilled. There's a divine protection around us. It doesn't give us permission to test the Lord your God and test him. Well, you know, if I'm protected by God until my time is over, then I think I'll run across E-470 and see how far I can get. Well, you're going to find out right then your protection ended right then and there. So don't do that. That's not, we don't tempt the Lord our God. We live wisely. We don't take what he says. Like, for example, when you learn the true understanding of the grace of God, that's not permission to go sin. Well, you know, man, if I'm going to see more grace when I sin, then I should probably sin more. No, nowhere, anywhere in the Bible does God give you permission to sin. And yet God has lavished his grace upon us. That he has loved us with an eternal love. So we don't tempt the Lord our God. But there is that divine protection in our lives. God's whole program for you has been laid out from eternity past. It's so good. And all the days of your life have been numbered by God, according to Psalm 139. All the heartaches, all the burdens, all the tears are kept safely and securely in a bottle by God. He cares so much about you. He knows the heat in your life, and he knows at just what temperature it needs to be. He's, his, God's hand is at the thermostat of your life. And he's in control. That's why it's foolish to live a life in rebellion to God. Doing your own thing. Not enjoying. Because what that does for a believer that decides to go goof off and play around is they don't get to enjoy all that God has for you. Even in the trials. A backslidden believer that gets into trials is double miserable. Triple miserable. They start taking things in their own hands and then they're quadruple and whatever the next numbers are. It just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. You don't enjoy. You don't have the joy of your salvation. You don't have the joy of living a life free from sin and death and destruction. God knows it all in your life and he's reminding us to trust him. And so Nebuchadnezzar has a change of heart here. And we'll see God's will for Nebuchadnezzar because as you guys read ahead in chapter 4, you know he's getting another dream. That's how God deals with Nebuchadnezzar. Nobody can get close to him, but God can get in his head. <laughs> You're praying for somebody right now? You can't, I can't get close to him. I don't, they don't want anything to do with me. Yeah, but God can get in their head. You can't get in their head, but God can get in their head. It's so cool. Now, before you leave, I just want you to consider something. I just want you to think through something. This is a pretty dramatic event in the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Pretty dramatic. I mean, super hyper, high on the level of dramatic. But we have to ask a question. Where's Daniel? Where's Daniel here? He's conspicuously missing. It's pretty exciting and intriguing to consider. You know, you can view this a few different ways as you study through the book of Daniel. Number one, we can view this true story historically, looking back at its significance for the nation of Israel. Secondly, we can view this story spiritually, this true story, as we, gain, as we ourselves gain great confidence and comfort in the faithfulness of a powerful God, especially in the midst of our trials, especially when trials last way longer than we ever wanted them to. Thirdly, we can view it, or yeah, thirdly, we can view it personally as we draw from this true story many personal applications how to trust God, how to hold fast to God, how to cling to Him through anything. But finally, remember Daniel is a book of prophecy. And we must remember the prophetic edge, seeing it as a picture of a coming event. Nebuchadnezzar foreshadows, I believe, another world leader. 
still yet to come on the scene. We've been introduced to him um, by this name, Mr. Antichrist, capital A. We don't know his human name, but he's known in the Bible, according to Revelation 13, uh, as the Antichrist. And he has a sidekick, the false prophet and the beast. And they erect a huge statue to be worshipped. And to worship the image involves a worldwide, global, one world economic and religious system that's known as Mystery Babylon. It's all tied together. It's bigger than what people think it is today. It's far greater, although we see pictures of it even today. I just got a text from a friend, a pastor friend of mine, that they have instituted widely in Saudi Arabia the use of an um, implanted microchip. And I know that every generation's seen that, but the technology today is unbelievable. Unbelievable what they're doing today. And they're not testing it on animals anymore. I remember teaching through this many, many years ago, and they were just popping chips into dogs so you could find your dog in the neighborhood. Well, guess what? They have moved on from dogs. Dogs still get their lame technology, but now they've got stuff that's GPS trackable. GPS trackable. Do you remember back in the day with our vehicles, they used to have that, that technology called LoJack? You guys remember that? It was the technology of the day, maybe 20 years ago, where they put a device hidden in your car somewhere, and then particular police cars were then also equipped with the system that they needed, that if they drove within some kind of radius, they would start beeping, and they could find it. They know where you're at 24-7. Do you know Google, Apple, Facebook, they all know where you're at. Now, Facebook, you told them where you were at because you checked in, but... They all know where you're at because those of you that have a phone in your pocket or a phone, oh, I left it in. They don't know where I'm at. I left it in the car. Okay, all right. Okay. And so when you think of this, you go, man, where's Daniel at? Well, I mean, if Nebuchadnezzar kind of pictures this guy, this, this guy is the final world ruler in the image and here you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reserved and preserved in the midst of a fiery furnace, which could picture the great tribulation period. As we know, 144,000 Hebrew young men will be preserved during the great tribulation period as evangelists of the gospel. Then what could Daniel possibly represent? But I believe in this text, Daniel could be a type and a picture of the church that's not mentioned at all during the great tribulation period, but rather raptured out before, while even those Hebrew evangelists are preserved during it. Now we know that Daniel's an administrator of the kingdom. Perhaps he's off on official business. The Bible doesn't say where he's at, but Daniel represents another group of people during the great tribulation period. I believe the church, and the church isn't there and isn't around, but will return. Why? Because God is faithful. God is faithful. Amazing stuff. So chew on it and think about it this week. Father, thank you for the privilege of studying your word and, you know, the fiery furnace. I just thank God that you had a word for a murmur and a complainer today. If they receive it, they'll embrace where you have them today. It's not about what they don't have. It's about what they have in you. We have all that we need in you. We have all that we need. As I heard our brother talk about the different mindset of values in another country and one of the reasons they value other things is because they don't have possessions. They don't have it, and there's no good, I, no good chance that they ever will. I know there's still that jealous, you know, that, that covetousness and that stuff inside their heart because they're human, but they've learned to live a different way. God, teach us as your church to learn to live a different way, to abide in you, to trust you, and Lord, to embrace the fiery furnace that we're in. I know that sounds amazingly hard, but I think if truth be told, we're, depending on what our situation is, we're all in a fiery furnace of some sort because our hearts are waiting for that, that city whose builder and maker is not man but God. And we're just pilgrims. And this world frustrates us. The politics of this world, the attitudes of this world, the culture of this world, the, the immorality of this world, it frustrates us. And if it doesn't frustrate us, it conforms us. And we don't want to be conformed into the world. We want to be conformed in your image. And so, Father, we dedicate our time to you tonight. Thank you for these young men that give us encouragement. 
that we might be bound today, but the trials in our life will free us from pride, from arrogance, from whatever it might be that's holding us back from enjoying you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.